flexible uh, and expressive uh, metaprogramming system, which is also securable. And th those constraints seemed ideally suited to the work that we needed to bring to JavaScript. So here's Tom. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. So I'm going to start off by briefly describing the new features added to ECMAScript 5th edition. This is the latest edition of JavaScript. Uh, just published in December of last year. So I'm trying to get everybody on the same page here, introducing some of the, the features of this language. So one of the uh, more important features added to uh, ECMAScript 5 was the um, addition of strict mode. So strict, in strict mode, the language uh, helps the programmer guard against uh, common pitfalls, rejects certain confusing features from the language, like the with statement, and will uh, throw exceptions rather than failing silently, for example, when you try to assign non-assignable properties. So the other uh, major addition to this uh, addition is the addition of an object manipulation API. So for those of you that are familiar with, uh, with Java, I would call it the, or you could consider it to be like the, the JavaScript lang reflect of uh, JavaScript. So um, what does this API look like? Well, it's an API that allows you to distinguish and define uh, data properties from accessor properties and allows you to define certain property attributes. So here's an um, example of a point declaration. The uh, point has a uh, data property called X and an accessor property called Y. So data properties are just bound to values. Accessor properties are uh, also known as getters and uh, setters. They will run when the property is accessed or assigned to. And so uh, in ECMAScript 5, there are these new uh, functions which are defined on uh, the object built-in called, for example, get own property descriptor. So these uh, functions, they take a, as a first argument, an object that you want to inspect, and second argument, sort of like a name uh, for which you want to have uh, uh, meta-level information. And what it returns to you is an object called a property descriptor, and depending on whether you're accessing a uh, uh, data property or an uh, accessor property, this property descriptor will have a different um, API. So for example, in the case of uh, data properties, you see that uh, it has a slot called value that says that the slot is bound to value five, and it has a number of what we call attributes, like writable, enumerable, and configurable. Uh, writable determines whether you can assign to it, enumerable determines whether it shows up in foreign loops, and configurable determines whether you can delete a property or whether you can change its attributes. And so if you ask the same information for a property bound to an accessor property, it instead has a get and a set slot that contains the actual uh, accessors, the getters and the setters. Okay, so you can query the system for this information. There's also an object dot define property, which allows you to either add new properties with custom attributes or to redefine some of the attributes of existing properties. Um, there are lots of other methods. I won't describe them all. One uh, further interesting uh, method is uh, object dot create. So it's a function that given a, uh, an object that will act as a prototype and this strange record here will create a new object and this, this, um, this record, it's called a property descriptor map, that's how I call it. It's, um, so it's an object whose keys represent the keys of the object you're about to define but whose values are not directly the values, rather they describe the, uh, the property descriptors associated with those values, okay? So this is um, a property descriptor map. It allows you to create new objects sort of at the meta level. You can specify more information about your object than you can uh, normally can with uh, JavaScript uh, literals, okay? So one final addition to ECMAScript 5, which I'd like to discuss before I um, discuss proxies, is the addition of ways to create tamper-proof objects. So in JavaScript, there are now these three methods called object.prevent extensions, object.seal, and object.freeze. And uh, for example, if you call object.prevent extensions on an object, uh, 
afterwards you cannot add new properties to that object. If you seal it, you can't delete properties. If you freeze it, uh, you can additionally not assign properties. So a frozen object really is frozen. You can't add stuff to it. Well, clients can't add stuff to it. Your clients can't delete stuff from it. Clients can't uh, assign properties. Okay, so I'm going to need these, uh, these functions uh, later when I discuss proxies. So, Proxies are a new uh, addition that we are proposing for ECMAScript Harmony. That's the code name for the next edition of uh, the ECMAScript language. And so they complement the existing metaprogramming API by allowing JavaScript programmers to define uh, generic handling of property access. And this allows, basically will allow JavaScript programmers to write generic wrappers. Generic wrappers useful for enforcing access control, for uh, tracing, uh, gathering uh, profiling information, and so on and so on. So for those of you familiar with uh, SpiderMonkey, which is the, the engine that's running uh, Firefox, it has this non-standard method called uh, no such method. Well, so this uh, with this feature, you can do all of the stuff you can do with no such method, method in a standardized way and in a more uh, stratified way. I will explain later what I mean by that. So the other thing is that these dynamic proxies, as I will soon describe, don't only allow you to generically handle property access. They will also uh, allow you to generically handle, handle other operations, which basically allows JavaScript prog programmers to create fully virtualized objects. So that would mean objects that don't really exist as objects in the system, like, for example, persistent objects, which are stored on disk, or, for example, remote objects, which live inside of another address space, and you can create local proxies for them. Uh, furthermore, it allows them to emulate the peculiar behavior of certain uh, what's called host objects. So host objects are uh, JavaScript objects that have uh, differing semantics because they're actually implemented in um, as native objects, as built in, uh, kind of built-in object. So, first of all, I'd like to point, point out that with the new uh, metaprogramming API I just introduced, it's already possible today in ECMAScript 5 to implement what I would call static proxies. So, for example, if you want to create a tracer abstraction that will simply trace all property accesses of a given target object, then what you can do is you can actually go ahead and create an object that will have all of the same properties as this object. So I'm not going to go into the details here. The important thing is that for each property in the original object, I'm defining a new property with the same name, and I'm going to define all properties as accessors where I include some tracing information and then go ahead and delegate the call to the original object. So, of course, this tracing information uh, is very simple here. You can uh, imagine how this could generalize to profile, collecting profiling information and, and, and so on. So the problem with creating proxies in this way is that um, they don't reflect structural changes made to the original object or vice versa. That means uh, if you add new properties to the existing object you're wrapping or add new properties to the proxy or delete properties, uh, these changes won't be reflected after the proxy has been created. That's why I call it a static proxy. It's not really connected to the object it's proxying, okay? So what dynamic proxies will allow you to do is to create proxies that um, <clears throat> are, can be made to, to reflect these structural changes onto the object they're wrapping. So here we're creating the same kind of tracer object. We're going to uh, trace all property access of, of this object here. And so uh, we're proposing the addition of a new built-in called proxy. It has this method called create. And when you invoke proxy.create, it returns a proxy whose behavior will be controlled by this object here. And this object is called a handler object. It defines a number of methods that will be invoked whenever uh, property access is performed on the proxy. And so this allows you to uh, intercept property access and property assignment, perform the tracing behavior, and then delegate the property access to the original object. Okay, so I'm going to have to introduce some terminology here from the, the uh, reflection community. So. What we're dealing with here is these proxy objects, they are what I would, what's called base level objects, 
they they are regular JavaScript objects. Uh, they so the application will directly communicate with these objects here. Now the, this handler object that controls the behavior of this proxy is what's called a meta-level object. Its sole purpose is to describe the behavior of another JavaScript object. Okay, and so proxy and handler are are implicitly connected by the call to proxy.create. Now. So this proxy.create call, you give it a handler and a prototype that, and this prototype uh, argument, this is an object that will serve as the prototype of your proxy. Now, so whenever the, in, the, in the system, in the, in the JavaScript runtime, some object uh, accesses a property of this proxy object, say uh, property foo, this will get reified or represented at the meta level as a call to the handler's get method. And we call these methods, uh, methods like a get, we call them traps. By analogy with operating systems, you're sort of trapping the property access and representing it at the meta level. And so you see that the, the get trap here takes uh, as uh, arguments the proxy on which the invocation was performed and uh, the name of the property being accessed. Now, so likewise for, for um, property assignment, whenever the code executes a property assignment where the receiver is a proxy, this will get reified at the meta level as a call to the handler's set trap, which takes all of the necessary arguments. Okay, so um, method invocations in JavaScript are not really special here. Uh, if, when you perform an invocation in JavaScript, what's actually going on is you're retrieving the property with the name foo, and then the system ex expects it to be a function and will apply the function, will call it, uh, passing the proxy as the receiver and uh, the arguments. So from the point of view of the, of the meta level here, there's nothing special. It will just trigger the, the handler's uh, get trap. Okay. Now, um, the title of this slide is stratified API. So what does this mean? It means that, so the proxy and the handler are cleanly separated. And these methods names like get and set have no particular meaning for the base level application. So let me illustrate this by means of an example. If for some reason your application defines properties called get and set, which is a perfectly viable thing to do, and you, uh, so someone accesses the uh, get property of a proxy, um, Notice what will, what, what will happen is that the get trap of the handler is invoked because we're doing a property access, but now the property name that's being accessed is just called get. So there is nothing special about the name get at base level. So that's an important part of stratification. So the namespace of these special um, um, names are defined on the handler, which is completely separate from the proxy. Now, Another reason why you could call this API stratified is that um, the prototype property of this handler is completely distinct from the prototype property of the proxy. So this, this proto property here is being defined when you create a proxy, and that will specify what the prototype is of this proxy object. The handler can have a completely separate uh, prototype, and these two don't interfere with one another. They're completely distinct. Okay. So. I've talked about intercepting property access, property assignment, but uh, this API actually reifies uh, a lot more than just that. For example, if uh, the base level code executes an, an in operation asking whether a certain uh, name is in a certain proxy, this will trigger the handler's has trap and it passes the, the, the property name and the has trap is expected to return a Boolean uh, that will then be used at the base level. Likewise, if you would try to delete properties from proxies, this actually gets trapped at the meta level. The handler can provide the sensible semantics for property deletion. More interestingly, if you perform a foreign loop over a proxy, uh, the proxy is allowed to specify what its uh, enumerable properties are. So what will happen is that the enumerate trap of the handler is called, and this enumerate trap is expected to return the array of uh, property names that are the enumerable properties of the proxy. And from that point on, from the programmer's point of view, what will happen is that the implementation will uh, perform a, for, a plain for loop over this uh, return value and will access the different properties and perform the for in loop body on those properties. So, so proxies can even uh, intercept uh, for in loops. Uh, 
Um, likewise, this new meta level API that I just described is also properly intercepted. So if uh, objects are trying to add new properties uh, to proxies using, for example, the define property method, this again will be uh, uh, trapped, it will be reified as a call to the handler's define property trap. And the handler can then define what it means to define properties. So proxies can trap quite a lot of operations defined on objects, but they can't trap everything. And there's good reasons for that. There are certain operations which you don't want to depend on user level code. For example, proxies have their own distinct object identity. And if you uh, compare them using triple equals to any other object, then well, this, this check is performed, this operation is performed entirely by the, the, the engine. Uh, the handler has nothing to say in this regard. That's because we want to make sure that uh, triple equals maintains all of the properties that programmers expect it to have, like reflexivity, transitivity, monotonicity, in the sense that if two objects ever compare to triple equals, then uh, you expect that relationship to hold throughout the entire lifetime of the program. Okay. So likewise, notice that because we pass this, uh, we, we force the, the meta-level programmer to specify the prototype of a proxy at creation time, this allows the system to answer the, the get prototype of query, which returns the prototype of an object without asking the handler for the prototype. Again, there is nothing in current ECMAScript standards that allows objects to have a mutable uh, uh, prototype link, and so we didn't want to allow this meta API to break that invariant, so handlers cannot break that invariant. Um, so because this prototype uh, link is fixed, uh, the, if uh, programmers uh, use instance of, this will not be, this, the outcome of this test will not be affected uh, by the handler if the left hand side is a proxy. And finally, if you perform a type of uh, operation on a proxy. This, again, uh, will not allow the handler to determine what the type of a proxy is. It will simply return object. So clearly there is a distinction between some operations which we allow handlers to implement and some operations which we don't for purposes of maintaining internal consistency. So if you're interested in what the full API looks like, this is it. It's about 12 different uh, traps uh, that are defined on the handler, each corresponding to a different base level operation. So this appears to be quite complex, but I mean, as uh, Albert Einstein once said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So uh, JavaScript is a complex language, and trust me, this is sort of like the minimal amount of traps you need to be able to faithfully emulate the behavior of a JavaScript object. So clearly, if the language is complex, it will show in the metaprogramming API. So having introduced this concept of uh, proxies, we can uh, now have a look at um, regular objects in a different, uh, from a different point of view, which is that, so uh, in, the, in the current JavaScript uh, systems, we have a base level, which is JavaScript territory. That's where your JavaScript objects live. That's where you can redefine your own uh, objects. The meta level is currently completely dominated by the, uh, that's VM territory. The JavaScript programmer uh, um, has no access to it and it's usually implemented in something like C++. So uh, what you can think, so normal objects which are not proxies can actually be thought of as proxies whose handler is specified by the virtual machine. So whose handler is sort of fixed by the virtual machine and uh, implements the default JavaScript semantics. And that's an interesting model because already there are some deviations on it, which are what's currently known as host objects. So there are certain objects which are also currently, whose semantics is currently implemented in C++ in the virtual machine, but which deviates slightly from the built-in JavaScript semantics, okay? So what uh, uh, proxies enable JavaScript programmers to do is they, they enable JavaScript programmers to invade this meta-level world and define new semantics for, exist for JavaScript objects, okay? So you're really giving a lot of power here to JavaScript programmers, and uh, this is quite important, uh, as uh, Brendan Eich recently said on, on the ES Discuss mailing list, uh, this basically allows JavaScript programmers to experiment with useful new semantics 
semantics of the language without either the VM implementers or the standardization committee having to be a bottleneck for innovation. So it really is a game changer. And But while I have this figure up here, I would like to stress that, um, okay, sorry. Uh, so what it allows you to do furthermore is that proxies can sort of um, be used to create the behavior, to recreate the behavior of host objects entirely within JavaScript, allowing these objects to be sort of self-hosted. So they no longer depend on VM internals. But so I'd like to stress though that it's the API doesn't allow you to redefine the semantics of existing JavaScript objects. Okay? So these links they really are sort of hardwired, and adding proxies to the language doesn't allow JavaScript programmers to redefine the semantics of existing objects, only of new proxy objects. That's very important for two reasons. First is security. It's not because you have a reference to some object that you should be allowed to install a new handler on that object and completely take over control of that object. Okay. Second reason is performance. Um, so. Of course, the, the semantics of, of these objects is heavily optimized in, in uh, virtual machines, and we don't want our uh, metaprogramming API to interfere there. So the metaprogramming API should only have an overhead on these proxy objects, so it only costs when you actually use it, okay? So, most JavaScript programmers will not actually be interested in redefining the semantics of uh, uh, the complete semantics of a JavaScript object. They will rather want to make small changes to the existing behavior of JavaScript objects. And to that end, uh, the, one of the most useful handlers that you can define is sort of like a handler whose job it is to simply forward all operations performed on its proxy to a certain target object. So this, this forwarding handler here takes an object that you want to wrap, stores it in a uh, uh, target property, and then uh, goes ahead and implements the entire API of the entire handler API by simply forwarding the, the, the trapped operation to the target object. Okay, so the situation is, is like this. The proxy traps all operations, uh, reifies them on the handler, handler dispatches them onto a target. So this uh, allows you to um, implement small uh, deviations of the, the existing semantics. So here's a simple, very simple example, a profiler that simply constructs like a histogram of all, uh, it, it simply counts the number of times certain properties have been invoked. And so if you want to create a simple profiler wrapping a certain target, we start off by implementing a forwarding handler which encapsulates sort of the default semantics of the language. And then we're just going to override its get trap such that it, it performs the count access and then delegates the call to the, the, the wrapped object. Okay, and so this, this abstraction here, it returns a proxy which wraps the target object and then uh, a method that allows it to, uh, allows clients to retrieve the statistics. So if you have a certain subject that you want to monitor, you just, uh, make a simple profiler for it, run your application with the proxy, and when your application has run, you can uh, sort of read out the statistics from this profiler. Okay, so this shows that um, you don't have to always implement this full handler API if you want to make good use of this metaprogramming API. You just have to uh, define the delta with respect to the, the default semantics. So, up to this point, I've uh, not talked about functions at all. So uh, in JavaScript, functions are objects, but not quite. JavaScript functions are objects, but additionally, you can also call them and you can also construct them. So they have some capabilities that normal objects don't have. And if you want to reify these at the meta level, really the, the, the best way we could come up with is to actually distinguish between object proxies and function proxies. So if you want to create a proxy for a function, what you do is you don't call proxy.create, you call proxy.create function. And so this returns a function proxy whose behavior is again determined by a handler. And this handler is completely identical in API to the handler you pass to proxy.create. So it completely handles all of the duties of a function as an object. 
But additionally, you can call and you can construct um, uh, functions. And that's why uh, this uh, create function method also has a call and a construct trap. These are functions that will be called when the function proxy is called or constructed. For example, if we call this function proxy, what's actually going to occur at the meta level is we're going to call this function instead. Okay. Likewise, if, we're, if code constructs the function by uh, prefixing the new keyword, this will trigger the construct trap instead. And this is actually very interesting because uh, for the, this would, for the first time, allow uh, JavaScript programmers to faithfully distinguish between uh, calling and constructing. So uh, there are certain various ways in which you can try to uh, figure out whether your function was called with the, the new keyword or not, but um, they're not uh, uh, foolproof. So this is a foolproof method to allow you to distinguish between calling and constructing. So again, uh, functions are objects. You can store properties in them and uh, access them, etc. And all of these accesses will simply be uh, reified as uh, traps on the handler, uh, entirely analogous to uh, object proxies. And like with object proxies, there are certain aspects of functions which we choose not to uh, intercept. For example, if you ask what the type of a function proxy is, it will always return function. It won't consult a handler for that. So you, uh, we want to uphold this constraint that uh, the type of a function is simply function. And likewise, notice that proxy.create function, unlike proxy.create, doesn't take a prototype as a second argument. Why is that? Well, the system uh, enforces that for function proxies, if you query it for the, the prototype, it will simply return function.prototype, since that's what functions are supposed to delegate to. Okay, so I've talked about these ver uh, various operations that allow you to create tamper-proof objects in uh, ECMAScript 5, like object.freeze, object.seal, and object.prevent extensions. And so the problem here is that um, if we have proxies and um, we are not enforcing these, these constraints, then uh, programmers can be very surprised. For example, if you freeze an object, as a programmer, you know that at that point, no more properties will be added to the object. But if the proxy is a, uh, if the object is a proxy with a handler, the handler can decide whatever it wants. So we have to somehow restrict the power of the handler. So what will happen is, if you call any of these three operations on a proxy, uh, this will trigger the handler's fix trap, and this fix trap uh, either returns a property descriptor map or undefined. If it returns undefined, that means that the handler isn't willing to fix the proxy. And at that point, the system will throw a type error informing the programmer that this operation is not allowed. If it does return a valid property descriptor map, then the system will use the property descriptor map to actually go ahead and create a new object. It will then perform the corresponding operation on that object. So if you froze the object, it will freeze it or otherwise seal it or uh, make it non-extensible. And then as a final step, the proxy will become this new object. Okay, so of course become is an operation you cannot implement in JavaScript itself, but VM implementers do have uh, quite easy ways to accomplish this. So really, you should, you should think of proxies as being in two possible states. A proxy is born in what's called a, what we call a trapping state in which it sort of intercepts all, all of these operations and, and uh, passes them through to its handler. But from the, point, from the moment it's fixed, it transcends into a, a terminal fixed state. And at that point, it no longer needs its handler. It will never again invoke it. And uh, for all intents and purposes, this is now a regular object. And because it is a regular object, uh, we can enforce the temper-proofness of uh, freeze, seal, and prevent extensions. So I've presented this uh, proposal at the ECMA TC39 meetings. Uh, this proposal is, is now an official proposal for ECMAScript Harmony. You can find the detailed semantics of it at the, uh, the given URL. And uh, there exists a 
and uh, a prototype implementation. So Andreas Gall from Mozilla has actually implemented an extension of TraceMonkey that supports this. And this has allowed me to, to, write, to write a couple of micro benchmarks. So here I have measured the time it takes to perform an operation on an object versus the time it takes to perform the same operation on uh, a proxy that simply performs this default forwarding behavior. So this no proxy that sim simply delegates the same operation to the wrapped object. So it's interesting to see that uh, type of triple equals, get prototype of, etc. These incur no overhead. That's logical because they are they are independent of whether an object is a proxy or not. Most of the other traps incur an overhead of between 1.2 and 1.8. Uh, which is what you would expect because they have to perform the original operation anyway and you also pay for the overhead of a, an extra method invocation on this handler object. So enumerate is somewhat off. Um, that's because the API is currently very awkward because the, the, the handler has to construct an array of, of uh, strings, has to pass this to the implementation and then the implementation has to perform a loop over that. So the goal here is that if ECMAScript Harmony has a good uh, proposal for generators or iterators, we will adapt our API to make it fit with this new proposal, which will probably uh, speed up this, uh, the cost, uh, will bring down the cost of this uh, enumerate trap. So to summarize proxies, um, dynamic proxies, they, there are really two main use cases here. First of all, it allows JavaScript programmers to write uh, generic wrappers for, for example, access control, profiling, writing adapters for existing libraries, etc. cetera. Uh, furthermore, because we allow so many operations to be intercepted, you can actually go ahead and really create virtual objects, so uh, objects that represent persistent objects, objects that represent remote objects. Uh, you can emulate uh, the behavior of certain uh, host objects. So these are all very useful uh, things. So with respect to the metaprogramming API, as I've presented it here, um, I would call it robust because it's stratified. So these, the namespace of this uh, handler is completely separated from the namespace of the objects that you're intercepting. And furthermore, we don't blindly allow all operations to be intercepted. So certain operations like type of and triple equals are um, uh, not intercepted. It's secure in the sense that you can't take over existing objects. You can't redefine the behavior of existing objects. <laughs> Uh, and furthermore, the properties of tamper-proof objects are maintained, so proxies can't circumvent those. And as far as performance goes, uh, really the important thing here is that there is no overhead for non-proxy objects, so you only pay uh, for, for the overhead when you really need the, the metaprogramming API. So how, how am I doing on time? Yeah. I think we can continue to the sort of the second uh, topic of this talk. Uh, so, and now for something completely different, I'd say, uh, traits. So what are traits? Traits are a way to do uh, object composition. You can think of them as an alternative to mixins or multiple inheritance, really. And so essentially, a, a trait provides a set of methods and requires a set of methods in order to implement those. And uh, really, tr the composition of different traits, I would call it robust, because name clashes that occur when two traits define properties of the same name uh, uh, lead to, to explicit conflicts. So uh, contrary to mixins or multiple inheritance, where one of either one of the methods will be preferred depending on the order of the composition. With traits, you will always get a name clash, no matter what the ordering is, and the name clash must be explicitly resolved uh, before you can actually uh, use the trait. Uh, furthermore, the composition of traits is a commutative and associative operation. What this boils down to is that the order of your composition is irrelevant. Uh, it's irrelevant, thus more declarative, uh, it's easier to reason about larger compositions uh, as a programmer. So traits were first implemented in um, Squeak Smalltalk uh, circa 2003 and have in their short lifetime received quite some adoption in other programming languages. Uh, for example, have been included in Perl 6. Uh, PLT scheme uses them, ex them extensively in its libraries. 
Guy Steele's uh, new Fortress language has picked up on them, etc. So uh, here at Google, together with Mark, I defined this library we call trades.js, um, which allows you to perform trade composition in uh, JavaScript. And we were motivated by two uh, reasons. First of all, of course, trade composition is more robust than the existing uh, composition mechanisms that JavaScript uh, offers, which is prototypal inheritance and mixing patterns where you simply copy all of the properties of one object and add them to another object. So it's more robust in that way. And another uh, important motivation was that even though ECMAScript 5 allows you to define tamper-proof objects with this object.freeze call, it's still fairly wordy. Uh, so uh, it's it's fairly inconvenient to create your own tamper-proof objects. So trades, in trades.js, instances of trades will by default be tamper-proof objects. So it's also an, an, an easy way of creating tamper-proof objects in ECMAScript 5. So the library is based on this property descriptor API that I've introduced at the beginning of this talk. And, but we define a small backwards compatibility layer such that it will also run gracefully on uh, existing ECMAScript engines, except that, of course, trade instances in an ES3 system will not be tamper-proof. Uh, the library works both in the browser and standalone at server-side, for example. So uh, the API of this library, is, the, the core API is fairly minimal. If you include the trades library, you, there are basically four things you can do. You can construct new trades, compose existing trades, resolve conflicts for trades, and instantiate trades into objects. So Constructing traits, you do that by calling this trait constructor, capital T. It takes uh, as its uh, sole argument a record describing the provided and the required properties of the trait. So provided properties are just normal properties. If you want to express a required property, what you do is you define a data property bound to trait.required. So the trait.required is kind of like a singleton value, like uh, null or undefined, which is exported by uh, the traits library. So trade composition is performed by the trade.compose operation. It takes a variable number of traits and returns a composite trait. So again, the ordering of the traits here uh, is completely irrelevant. Um, trait resolution allows you to deal with um, uh, conflicts. It allows you to avoid conflicts by renaming properties. So for example, you can rename uh, property in this trait uh, the property A, rena rename it to C, and you can, if you rename something to undefined, this basically means you, you don't want it anymore. You exclude the property from the trait. And then finally, uh, if you want to instantiate traits, uh, just like there is this object.create method in ES5, we define trait.create, which has a, an, a similar signature. It takes a prototype, uh, which will be the prototype of the trait instance, and a trait to instantiate. And in this case, the object O being returned here is a, is a frozen, is a tamper-proof uh, object. So let me give a brief example of what you would use uh, traits for. So here's a trait that captures the reusable behavior of enumerability. So an enumerable trait defines uh, properties like map, filter, and reduce, higher order operations. Uh, if only the composer wants to give it a for each method that will enumerate the sequence. And so based on these for, this for each method, so it, it can access it using uh, self-sense, uh, it can provide these higher order operations, okay? So I'm not going to go into the details here. If you want to use this uh, enumerable trait, for example, say you want to create an enumerable interval, you do this as follows. So here's a function called make interval you give it a minimum and a maximum, it constructs for you an interval uh, bound, an open interval with minimum inclusive, maximum exclusive. And uh, so the, the instance will be a trait instance. It will delegate to object.prototype. And uh, so the trait being instantiated is a composition of the enumerable trait, which defines this reusable behavior, and a sort of anonymous inline trait that defines the semantics of intervals. In this case, it defines like a start and an end property, a contains method to check whether an element lies within the interval. And then it defines this required for each method uh, simply by uh, viewing the interval as a sequence of integers starting from minimum up to uh, the maximum, okay? So 
uh, when you uh, construct the interval by calling the make interval function, you can then go ahead and invoke operations like map reduce and uh, filter. So they, it's as if they are defined directly on the, the instance. So this uh, our trace library actually represents traits as property descriptor maps. So when you create a, a, a trait using the trait constructor, it will simply transform this record that you give it into a property descriptor map. Recall, a property descriptor map is an object whose keys represent the keys of, a, of some other object and whose values are bound to property descriptors that describe all of the attributes uh, of a given property. And notice also that we add additional metadata uh, as in the form of attributes to some of these properties. So required properties, for example, have this required flag and uh, data properties bound to functions will be tagged as methods. I will explain later why that is the case. So, but it's fairly important to, to notice that, uh, so we just represent traits as this standard uh, property descriptor map format that was defined in ES5. So if you go ahead and uh, compose, uh, for example, these two traits, T1 and T2, then you'll see that they both define a, um, a B property. So when you compose them, this B property will be replaced by something we call a conflicting property. And if you would then try to create an instance of that trait, you'll get an exception saying that uh, there's a certain conflict which you need to address. If you want to resolve that conflict, what you do, what you could do in, in, in this case for ex is, for example, to uh, prioritize uh, uh, T1's uh, B property over T2's B property. And you can do that by using the trait.resolve call. You can uh, create a new trait whose B property is actually redefined to a uh, required property, so it's sort of excluded from the trait composition. And then later when you compose this resolve trait with T1, now we are composing a required property B and a provided property B, and we will simply um, so define B to refer to uh, T1's property. So if you then create an instance of this uh, trait, you will get a valid uh, trait instance. So final operation, trait instantiation. So that's done using this trait.create call and you give it a prototype and a property descriptor map uh, that represents the trait. And really um, what's going on here is very similar to uh, calling object.create, except that uh, in addition to what object.create does, trait.create will also throw an exception if it encounters any remaining conflicting or required properties in this trait. Furthermore, it will bind the this binding of all properties tagged as methods to the new trait instance. So this is uh, to ensure that the object is tamper proof in the sense that clients are not able to trick the trait into uh, rebinding its uh, this value. Uh, or this could also happen by accident if clients would extract a method from a trait, use it as a fun arc, in which case it would be bound to, to um, uh, undefined or the global object. So to prevent that, we explicitly bind this upon instantiation and furthermore, we freeze the resulting object and we freeze its methods. So this makes sure we get tamper-proof objects without the programmer having to write all of these tedious uh, object.create, uh, object.freeze calls, okay? So there is one uh, open issue here. Uh, the, because we bind the disbinding, of methods when we create trait instances. That means that if you create multiple instances from the same trait, they won't be able to directly share the same method instance. Rather, they will each have their own bound method instance. And so that really is a quite a, it's a, an overhead in terms of uh, space, uh, which is really very tricky to deal with as a library author without support from, from uh, the runtime. So to summarize, uh, Trace.js is a very minimal trait composition library for JavaScript, which uh, represents traits as property descriptor maps. And the interesting thing here is that you can you can use you can actually pass traits to the object.create uh, built-in 
uh, ES5 function, and that will simply generate a new object instance which is not tamper-proof, and which will also ignore, uh, simply ignore the trait uh, metadata. Um, now, if you pass the trait to trait.create, you will uh, generate a new trait instance which is a tamper-proof uh, object. And of course, there is still this open issue that I've just um, described to you. So if you're interested in, in this library, you want to play around with it or uh, look into it in more detail, so the URL is uh, www.tradesjs.org. So I'm about to conclude my talk here. Um, just to summarize the different things I've uh, talked to you about today. So first of all, um, with the addition of ES5 strict mode, um, you can really think of, well, that subset of JavaScript at least as a very robust programming language. It really is very robust. It really makes sure that uh, programmers don't uh, um, fall into, like, uh, uh, there are no, no pitfalls for the unwary. Um, now, proxies are a new meta-programming API for ES Harmony, and I would characterize it as a robust meta-programming API. It's stratified, and we've put a lot of thought into what operations should be uh, intercepted, what operations uh, should not be intercepted. Um, so then I've talked about this, this, this new traits library uh, that already works in ES5, which really is uh, a robust composition API, robust in the sense that uh, name clashes have to be explicitly resolved, and the trait composition is uh, declarative because ordering uh, doesn't matter. And so as Mark discussed in the introduction, this is sort of the, the second in a series of talks on uh, changes to, to ECMAScript. So hopefully uh, Mark or Tyler will in one of the coming talks talk about uh, new abstractions that we're devising for robust event-driven programming in ECMAScript, so following with the uh, robustness theme here. So if you're interested in any of the things that I've discussed about, that I've discussed here today, we've set up a little Google code project called ES-Lab. So if you go to the following URL, you can find uh, further information. So that concludes my talk, and I would be very happy to answer all of your questions. Hi, uh, Brad Newberg. Uh, it's great to see the metaprogramming come to JavaScript. It's going to help a lot of frameworks. Um, maybe this is a larger question, but one of the issues with JavaScript is really programming in the large, both from a productivity standpoint and from deploying so much script. What primitives do you see in ES5 to help with that? With programming in the large, um, I can't really think of any primitives that are directly supported. Uh, um, one of the more uh, relevant uh, topics here is uh, modules. So currently in ECMAScript Harmony, uh, there is a big discussion going on on uh, various proposals for module systems that would allow you to define modules with explicit imports and exports, which I think would, uh, would be a big help for programming in the large. But uh, yeah, that's not available in ES5. Uh, and that's not something that uh, that I've looked into. Uh, we have, uh, as an answer to your question, we have uh, other plenty of other things uh, on the table for ES5 and modules and classes and some kind of rudimentary API enforcements are right. definitely on the table for ES Harmony, right? Or, yes, so yeah. ES Harmony. Yeah, it, it, it'd be nice to see those because ES4 had some of those, but maybe it was too Java centric, and sometimes. Uh, you have to be a bit of a, a JavaScript wizard to do programming in the large, and <laughs> that's causing some folks to go towards abstractions like Google Web Toolkit. Mm -hmm. And it'd be nice to be able to kind of help go in the other direction against that. So I agree. Well, the question was, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think that you have to be, when you get to, a, I, I think JavaScript is an amazing programming in the small and medium language in a way that I think other languages aren't. I think you can get started quicker. I think jQuery has shown that. But for programming in the large, when you're getting into a really substantial code base, something like Gmail or really sort of biting off a big app, I think you have to be too much of a wizard knowing the, the specifics of the language 
to kind of get day in and day out work done. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, you just have to have a deep understanding that it's a prototype based language, that everything is actually a function, understanding closures. And that makes it hard, I think, for large distributed teams to pick up and also have good encapsulation between different parts of the system. Mm -hmm. And it requires, I think, a great deal of sort of programmer good habits. And uh, it'd be nice, you know, the thing I love seeing about the traits and, and, uh, and the proxies is it's, it's, it's a JavaScript approach to these things. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to find the JavaScript answer to being able to have, I don't, when I say more junior programmers, I don't mean that in a negative way, but not having to be a wizard of the language to build systems. And I think that's one of the problems with JavaScript. And that's just the productivity level. In terms of deployment, um, page load latency is so important. You want to glom everything together. And so you need lots of build time tools that I think when you get to a certain scale really hits your productivity. Mm -hmm. And it'd be nice to have more support. That may be slightly outside of JavaScript, but it'd be nice to take the larger picture mm -hmm. like HTML5 has done. They've said, okay, let's look at APIs, not just markup. So maybe widening that scope. So. <laughs> Any more questions? Hi, Jimmy Lin. I was just curious, so for the trade stuff, do you see something like that going directly into the language, or does it even need to be since, it's, mm. since it can be a JavaScript library? <laughs> so we ha we've had some discussion about that. Um, I think, um, well, as they stand, um, they don't really need a lot of support from, uh, well, uh, the language, I think. Um, the problem is that, uh, um, having tamper-proof objects be able to efficiently share methods is a big issue, which we currently don't know how to solve uh, at the library level. So that would definitely help. I also know that, um, well, um, I think if something like this would actually make it into the language, it would probably uh, have its own syntax, so better support with uh, its own dedicated syntax, which would also enable uh, the, uh, the JavaScript engines to much more heavily um, optimize them. Because currently, uh, such a system in, in this uh, library, the sort of the implementation has to infer that you're actually using trade composition. It's not native to the language. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there, we were actually surprised at how usable traits could be without uh, dedicated syntax because of JavaScript's excellent object literal notation syntax. So it is, it's fairly doable. Any more questions? Okay, so thank you all for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.